Psalm 103, let's begin in verse 7. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For, uh, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. For as for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness, and to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. And the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you as saints, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray together. Lord, as we uh, are just thinking about all that we have to be thankful for during this time, we recognize that we could never thank you enough. If we spent the rest of eternity, you've done so much for us, even more than we even realize. So we pray that you would use these verses for your purposes. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who knows how to minister to each one of us uniquely. Lord, so, we're so grateful for the pattern that we've learned in the Calvary Chapel movement under Pastor Chuck and other leaders to, to focus on your word uh, and let it speak for itself. Uh, we don't want to hear from man. We want to hear from you directly. So would you be our teacher this morning? Would you comfort? Would you redirect? Would you convict? Would you encourage? I pray that you would encourage your people this morning as they hear your word, Lord. Encourage me, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're concluding a two-part uh, series, uh, and we, last week we covered verses 1 through 6, and this week, we're, as you know, we're going to start in verse 7 and go to the end of the chapter to finish it up. Um, spending more time to, like towards the first, like seven through, you know, almost the end of the verses, and uh, because there's really some key things that I want to zero in on. Um, David is telling his soul, as we began to see last week, he's he's telling his soul uh, to bless the Lord, and to worship, and to think about all these things about which he's, um, you know, sharing with us things about the Lord and so forth that we can think about and thank God for. And we have so much more to thank God for than he lists in this chapter, the whole chapter. I mean, obviously, I talked about last week going to Ephesians chapter 1 and seeing that amazing run-on sentence that just speaks of all of our wealth in Christ Jesus. It's unbelievable. So he says, bless the Lord, uh, six times in this chapter. It only says it eight times. 18 times in the whole book of Psalms, but uh, and he says a little bit next, the next Psalm, in Psalm 104, but he, he's saying, praise the Lord, praise him, think about him, acknowledge him, acknowledge how he's been amazing to, to us, or to you, and he's encouraging his soul, and, and as I talked about last week, we need to awaken our souls to, from dullness, as dullness can happen uh, we, it's our reaction to blessings and prosperity. It can get to the point where if we're not thankful continuously, purposely, then we can completely have those things uh, dull us and then we become ungrateful. And I mentioned that um, it's a mark of the end times. And you know, we're told in Second Timothy chapter 3 that, that he lists all these things. In the last days, they'll be lovers of themselves, lovers of, you know, all these things. Um, and he only includes in there uh, ungrateful. They'll be ungrateful. 
that was important enough for God to move on the Apostle Paul's heart to write down for us the fact that he notices when we're ungrateful. And and it's a heart issue. And it overflows for other people to see through our mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's actions that we do that show and reveal to those from without around us that we're ungrateful. And, but in reality, it's, it starts from the inside, and he sees all of that. God sees everything that's in going on in our hearts. He sees if we're thankful. And it's so easy to do, expressing thankfulness. is so easy to do, but why don't we do it? I think what causes ungratefulness in the believer, there's a few things. Allowing ourselves to become dull to prosperity, as I mentioned. Comparing ourselves among ourselves. We're told that in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, verse 2. Which, and it's, then Paul wrote to the church of Corinth and said, it is not wise to do that in commending ourselves and commending ourselves am, among ourselves. Like talk about a repeating word there uh, in that passage, but also not obeying the Lord and being thankful in all things. First Thessalonians 518 that we saw last week. I read that verse is that we call us to be thankful, not thankful for all things, but thankful in all things. And, and just to be honest with you know, what he wants to do through it. See, we have this great safety net called God's sovereignty. And we feel like it's a safety net, but really, really it's, a, it's, a, it's a parachute. <laughs> you know, it's something that we're hanging from. It's, 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 under, it's strengthening us. We're, it's supporting us. We think somehow it's a safety net, but it's not. Because he says that God works all things together for good. The worst thing anybody could do to us in most people's minds is kill us. If our lives are taken from us. But if that happens, we're with Christ. We're better off. That's why when Paul was in, in the book of Acts, when, when he, they were warning him that, you know, these things await you in Jerusalem and all these trials and everything, he said, none of those things move me. Why? Because he'd already died. He was already dead. You can't threaten someone with death if they already, already died in the sense that they've, counted, they've crucified their life. They've de- they're, they're a bondservant. They're yielded to to whatever God wants. My life is yours. Do with it as you will. I trust you. By that point, Paul had had a few jailbreaks. You know, he knew that God could could get him out if that's what God wanted. He trusted in God's sovereignty. So um, he tells us to be thankful in all things, but then also not realizing every good and perfect gift is from above. I think that's another thing. We don't actually give God credit for things that have come into our lives that are a blessing, that are good. And, and he doesn't hold anything back. And he, and he blesses even the, the unjust. It says he, it rains on the unjust and the just. So he lo- he's gracious and loving and all these things. He, he blesses people way before. How many of you remember, and I love hearing a testimony right before bringing this up, but how many of you remember God's faithfulness to you before you crossed over from death to life spiritually? Raise your hand high. Let me see him. You remember like God was involved. I mean, God's involved with our lives from, from day one, and he knows us in, his, in our mother's womb. He you know, obviously he knows us from eternity past. But leading up to our salvation, uh, he is very much at work. And that's what I love, the fact that we get to be part of someone's story. Because we may be sowing the initial seeds. We may be watering. You know, Obviously, God's the one that causes everything to grow. He brings the increase. God does all the work. The secret to effective evangelism and the secret to effective ministry is letting God do the work. Let it, trusting the Holy Spirit to work on the other end. And it doesn't all depend on us at all. You see that when you, when you try to have it depend on you. It's like, whoa, that didn't work. You know, just I have so much confidence in the Holy Spirit's work and in your lives, in my life, in unbelievers' lives. So he's, you know, he's talking about here in the psalm to be thankful, to be purposely recognizing that all these gifts are from God. God is always working in our lives for us to not be ungrateful, but for us to be uh, thankful. And so that's why I believe David said, do not forget all his benefits. And he's going to continue with itemizing and referencing his benefits today. And it's just most of the chapter. And we've already covered a a handful last week. So, um, and I told you one thing before we start our verse here. I mentioned that when he talked about his benefits, that that really equals God's way or his ways. Uh, and and, and it, actually, there's, 
other things that equate with those things all at the same time as well. So I just want you to see how, how God's going to do that. And I mentioned that. I mentioned he's going to reveal Moses and talk about Moses and how God was faithful to Moses. Uh, and we see that in verse 7. Notice there he says, We make known, he made known rather, his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. So God is speaking, David rather, um, God is speaking through David. He's speaking about God's ways. And, and, I want, and there's a point at which Moses has expressed this. And I want you to actually read it to you in Exodus 33, verse 13. It says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. <laughs> Moses, like, God, you got to show me this nation belongs to you. <laughs> you know, uh, and, but he wants to know his way. He wants to know him. That's what we want to know. We want to know God's way and his ways. We want to know him and all that. And this is connected to the, how, how God is because Moses is trying to get to know Yahweh. And, and, he, and he does use, the, you know, as we get into this, and we've already seen it, he uses the word Lord, all caps, in, in our translation, it's Yahweh. So he wants to, to know him. And knowing his way was to know him, and they were connected. They're inseparable. Who he is is connected to his way or his ways uh, in our lives. And David's, the way he talks about it is his benefits. So all this connects together. So to know him is to know his way, and to know his way is to know him. His way, his benefits, and his acts. We look, notice in verse 7, um, at the last part of verse 7, he says, his acts to the children of Israel. All those things are connected. So he's revealing himself to the children of Israel. He's revealing to Moses that the children, <laughs> the children of Israel belong to him. Uh, and he's showing him his faithfulness. And talk about benefits that the children of Israel got to witness and see. God's supernatural. But again, what did that? it still didn't affect because they didn't properly process those things that God had done in their life, his acts, they didn't properly process that, and they were ungrateful, and they complained. I know we can't relate to that. That's, that's you know, another church down the road. We, we never do that. We're never, uh, you know, ungrateful, but they're inseparable there. So I believe that's why David writes this in the middle of listing his benefits. It's like David is saying, we're not the only ones who have enjoyed these benefits. Look at the Israelites in the wilderness. Look how God is like, we're, this is, you know, this is around 1000 BC, right, when David's writing this. And, you know, this happened hundreds of years before that, where God revealed himself to the children of Israel in the wilderness and manifested himself and and in that passage in Exodus 33, Moses is saying, you don't go with us. We, I don't want to go. I don't want to even attempt this if you're not going with me and us, you know, the children of Israel. And that's, it's always been the same. It's always been the same. God's way is revealed by his faithfulness and us getting to know him. And then he shows himself before we come to know him, after we come to know him. He blesses us. He manifests himself to us. We're going to see in our Gospel of John uh, series that we're, we'll get back to, Lord willing, next Sunday, that Jesus talked about that I'll come and manifest myself to them, talking about us. And, and God loves to manifest himself to us. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Now, he continues to list his benefits here in verses 8 and 9. He says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. So again, he, ne he mentions there in the beginning of verse 8, the Lord, all caps, Yahweh, Jehovah, um, is merciful and gracious and slow to anger, all these things. So mercy, you may know this, but if you don't, maybe it would be the first time. But if, not, if you already know, it's good to be reminded. Mercy is not getting something bad that you deserve. Grace is something that you, that's good that you get that you, that you don't deserve. So that's, that's how that works. And he's saying the Lord is merciful. Is mer that's who he is. And this is his character. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. That can be convicting. You know, they say you find out what's in a vessel when it gets bumped. 
you know, there's just something that happens, you know, anger. He says, anger and do not sin. You know, that doesn't produce the righteousness of God. The, ang- the rage of man, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I haven't th- thought about that verse in so long. I can't believe that just popped in my head. But it's so good. It's so perfect. But God isn't like that. He's, he has a righteous anger 100% of the time. He can't be, you know, damaged. You know, he's unchangeable. In- all powerful, all his attributes. He's, but just how think, just how, just think how gracious God has been to us, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. So he's been so gracious with us. He was gracious with us before we came to know him, and and then he was gracious with us to help us understand what what grace was for us. And some of us didn't even understand what grace was when we received Christ. But then we learn like, wow, this is unmerited favor, undeserved favor, getting something good that I don't deserve. That's how God works. He is that. He cannot, here's an English teacher, double negative for you. He cannot not be gracious. He, that's just who he is. And he's, remember, all his attributes, he has to be the most of all those things necessarily. So, so he's, he's good. He's all good. He's all like the max all the time. But he's also just. And, and, and so he's dealt with all of that by the cross. He's with, related to us. And I love how he uses the word abounding there. Abounding in mercy. I love that. I need that. His mercies are new every morning. And I need that mercy every single morning. I love reminding myself about that. That his mercy is new. He's not going to change. But, he, but that won't always be the case. You know, in verse 9 he says... He will, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. So keep is really getting to the idea of, of withholding. He's withholding anger. You know, It's so funny how people go through this world that don't know the Lord, and they just think that everything's always going to continue how it's continuing, and there's not wrath being stored up, um, and there's a timing to all that. But, and we're as believers, we're told specifically that we're not appointed unto wrath. So when we think about what's coming, though, the great tribulation, that's going to be, God's going to pour out his wrath. And, and there's going to be judgment that happens. By the end of the seven-year tribulation, only 25% of the world's population, roughly, is left. Think about that. What are we, six billion people? <laughs> so it's like... Only 2 billion people are going to be left, something like that. I don't know when it's going to happen, but, you know, I mean, you get the math. It doesn't matter. It's a percentage. <laughs> you know, uh, however the population grows, uh, you know, 25% uh, with when you track all these judgments and how many people die and all of that, and it's just incredible. So he's not always going to strive with man. And, you know, and after that, he's going to have the millennial kingdom, and then there's going to be, for a, th- a thousand years of peace, Jesus is going to rule physically on this world, and then there'll be a rebellion at the end where Satan is loosed, and they're people that want to actually attack the city of God, Jerusalem. And then God destroys them with fire from heaven. So you'd think, how is that possible? The, Jesus is ruling and reigning. Well, there'll be people that, that don't have their new bodies. And they'll have a sin nature. And they'll have to receive Christ. And God will honor their choice. I mean, he'll reveal to them who he is and all of that. And um, so they'll have that opportunity. And so the only thing left for us as believers is that we're going to be, you know, snatched out of here, and, and I believe, and then we're going to have new bodies, and we're going to have glorified bodies, and we're going to enjoy the wedding supper of the Lamb, and we're going to be married to our, you know, our fiancé uh, there, and with Christ being the bridegroom. So it's a beautiful expression of God's grace to us, and David is just going over this and over this and over this, and he's in the Old Covenant. Think about that, the Old Covenant. God's still being gracious with them in the old covenant. He was great because he is who he is. It's so funny when people think, oh, God was the God of you know, law and anger and everything in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, there's a, almost like a different God. That, you know, it's the same God. Ask Ananias and Sapphira you know, in the book of Acts. Uh, well, I guess you can't ask them. But you know, if you were to ask them, uh, you know, it, it, that's, that's like straight out of the OT. That's straight out of the Old Testament, that type of like, just think of the fear that happened in there in that, after that happened. 
What if someone came in here, and I'm no Peter, but let's say someone came in here and God gave me a word of knowledge and they misrepresented what they gave, you know, and, and they dropped dead. I think that might get around the coast side at least if that happened, you know, um, in terms of, and that, but the, God dealt with that. Why did he do that? I don't know. He didn't tell me why. He doesn't reveal it in this word. You can kind of put it together that the hypocrisy is such a dangerous cancer that goes through the church that he's wanting to show that that's not what I'm about. That's not my kingdom. That's not how I work. So um, uh, verse 10 says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. So remember, David is writing this under the Old Covenant. And the word atone in the Old Testament was to cover. And so that, they're, they're, it would have this covering, and people describe it this way, although it's not explicit in Scripture, that basically sins are rolled ahead by one year and then rolled ahead by another year and another year and another year. And then when Jesus was on the cross, all those sins were, he took the punishment for all those sins. But the word atone in the New Testament means to take away. It's a totally different word. So it's even better for us. But this is how God was dealing with with them and was gracious even in that. Because God set up that system. They're following his system. That's why he even could be covered. You know, he didn't go through his priest, his way, with the way he said to do it, on the, certain, the days he said to do it, like, it's so funny when people go, you know, um, I don't really appreciate Leviticus. Man, there's so much in Leviticus to learn about how, you, how unapproachable God is apart from coming his way. We should be thankful that there is even a way to be saved. I heard this a long time ago, and I'll just repeat it quickly. If you fell over, you know, a ship, you know, that happens. You fall over the side of a ship, and they threw you a life preserver, you know, and you saw it, and it was, and, and you, you know, you were you were drowning. You know that you're toast. You're out in the middle of the ocean, and who's going to go? I I'm offended by this. There should be many ways to get back in that boat. How dare you just throw me one way to be saved? You wouldn't do that, and that's what this world's doing. By God has the right to make it as narrow as possible, and it's narrow because it's based on righteousness. And, and there's only one way to get the righteousness that God will accept, and that's accepting Jesus Christ, not trying to get that righteousness yourself. Because he reveals in Isaiah that our righteousness are, is like filthy rags. That's our best performance. It's like filthy rags. To say nothing of our sin. He's talking about our religious works is like filthy rags to him, if we were to try to offer that to him. So... Um, you know, he, 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 you know, but the, one of the things I wanted to focus on just briefly here is in, is just thinking about if we've accepted as New Testament believers, um, if he's accepted his forgiveness and we're, how we're thinking about how he deals with us. And I want to ask, is this you? And it may not be, which is fine. I hope, you know, it's, we're all different places. You believe he is dealing with you or dealt with you according to your sins after you've confessed and repented. You've confessed your sin to him, 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's writing to that to believers. That's how when we sin, because he knows that we're going to sin, that's why he put it in there. When we sin, we need to ask forgiveness, confess those sins. The word confess means to say the same thing as. Agreement is another way of saying it. You agree with God that those things are, are bad and you're asking for forgiveness, you're repenting, all of that. Um, so we can do that and do and still think that God somehow holds that holds a grudge, or is it punishing me somehow, or something bad that's happened that Scripture says the enemy has caused. You're saying that God is doing that or allowing that in your life because of this one thing that Jesus paid for, and that you asked for forgiveness and you repented, but you still feel like He hasn't let it go. That's not biblical. I'm just telling you, no matter what your emotions or your thoughts tell you, that's not biblical, that's not scripture. We have to submit our emotions and our thoughts to what scripture says, because scripture is correct. Our emotions are lie. Have you ever noticed that? You know, lying emotions. We can't go by that. This whole new generation defines truth by their emotions. How they feel. How they, you know, how they interpret things. Well, do I feel that that's true? Like, they're this, some barometer or some source of knowing you know, it's like, no, God has revealed truth. And things are self-evident. The whole creation demonstrates that there is a creator. 
All this design that we see, but not, that didn't all happen by random chance. If you believe that, you have more faith than I do. The point is, is that God created everything. It reveals his nature. It reveals so many things. I can share so much about God just by creation. How intelligent he is, how powerful he is, that the creation exists at all. That he's a designer, he's creative. All these things, it's so beautiful just by looking at the creation. Then, then, then he's given us a conscience that helps us to understand that we've fallen short of a standard. And we have guilt. We have the standard that's pressed upon us that is infinitely higher than what we live. But if we, it, it evolved through us, it would be at the same level that we live, not higher. It doesn't make any sense. There's so, it's like there's, there's so much under, misunderstanding. So he does not punishing you or punishing you related to your iniquities if you confess and repent it. So that's good news. Really good news that we can rejoice. And, and again, this is like a shadow version. You know, Colossians says that, you know, all those things were a shadow of the Old Testament. You know, the Sabbaths, the, all those things. Uh, the festivals, the new moons, all those things. But the substance is Christ. Those were a shadow, foreshadow of, of what was to come. So now we're in the fulfillment of it. Now, all of that is God's nature didn't change, of course, through the whole thing. Uh, but it's just how he, worked the, how he worked it out to have the new covenant, which Hebrews says is a better covenant than the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. So it's interesting that we see that it... That, and we'll see this in the beginning of verse 11, that it, there's two things that I want to focus on in these next two verses. One, inconceivable, how something is inconceivable and how something is immeasurable related to his dealing with David's sin uh, in an inferior covenant. Look at verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so, so great is his mercy toward us, toward those who fear him rather. How high is the heavens above the earth? Do you know? Do you have you Googled it? Go ahead. There's lots of things that Google is not correct on for sure. But, as, you know, you, you get different answers. Like, it's, it's inconceivable. It was inconceivable then. It's inconceivable now. We don't know. It's inconceivable. Yet, that's uh, what we need mercy and to that same extent, God says, as far as the heavens, as high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. What does it mean, fear? Does that mean like punishment fear? No, it's talking about reverence and awe. Those that are submitted to him, it's, so, it's, it's inconceivable. Then there's um, immeasurable. Look with me at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You can go north forever on the earth, and then eventually you're going to start going south. By the way, I heard, saw this comedian say this once. He goes, you have all the time zones that go around the whole globe. Let's say this is a globe. All the time zones. So when you're at the top, let's say you're on the North Pole, does it work like this where you go 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock? Because all those lines go up to the top, and you have this little space. You know, it was funnier when he said it, but... Um, Anyway, I just thought that was hilarious. I can't not share that with you. It's just funny. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. Maybe I'll send out the clip so you can really enjoy it. Uh, but anyway, at the top, you, so you start going south. You can't go north forever, but you can go east forever. You can go west forever. They never meet. It's beautiful. So as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions for us. So he's trying to say, it's never going to happen. You don't have to worry about that. And I just want to address if someone isn't having confidence that those things have been forgiven. They have. They couldn't be any more forgiven. He's saying this before the Messiah was going to take all their sins on him and the future sins of mankind and take the wrath that we deserved on himself. And, and, and that hasn't even happened yet. We're on the other side of that by 2,000 years. It's incredible to think about that. So... Don't hold on to things. Don't think that he hasn't forgiven you when he has. It's a sin. It's a sin to say he hasn't forgiven me when he already has. You can't do that. It's not right. It's not appropriate for you to do that. We have to align our emotions and our thoughts with his word. Very important. So now in verse 13, David puts our focus on God's heart. It says, as the father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him for he knows our frame he remembers that we are 
dust. Anytime I see God reveal the truth about mankind in light of what they say, it just blesses me to see him. We're just but dust. Well, where's all the human, humanism here? <laughs> you know? and where's all how great we are? And we're going to take over the world and be gods over this world. Where is all that? No, God says that's why we need God's perspective. We need it every single day. We need it when we come to church. How dare these people that are behind pulpits and how dare they not teach God's word? That's what we need. We need God's word. We, need, we don't need self-help prosperity principles. We, don't, we need God's word. We need the eternal truth. We need the hard things. Pastor Chuck used to always say that. Fellas, don't give them just the sweets. Give them the meat and potatoes. You know, give them what they need, not just what they want. You know, that's what a true parent does. I'm not a parent, but you know, just you, you give them what they need. You love them enough to give them what they need, even when they don't understand it, even when they don't appreciate it, you still do that. That's what we're called to do. And so he's not keeping score. He's not holding sin against us. What? He, what does he have? He has pity. He has pity on us. Just as a father has a pity on his son. Boy, man, so many times my mom I was raised by a single mom. Man, did she have pity on me sometimes. And I, I was pitiful. <laughs> you know, and just you just like, how did I get in this situation? You know, I mean, you're seven and you're in this situation, and, or 10, or whatever, and they're like, how do you, how did you end up here? So, um, but he knows how frail we are. He knows how um, we are just but dust. We, re- we came from dust, we're going to return to dust, all of that. So he knows our frame. He remembers we are, we are something so fragile. We think that we're so <laughs> invincible as humans, but we are so... Look what he says in verse 15. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. I want to focus on the word place there. And its place remembers it no more. Think about your legacy. How many, I don't believe this is going to go, we're going to go on for a massive amount of time, uh, personally. But let's say that happens. And you're, you know, I just saw someone share this on a video about three, three generations, they won't even pretty much know anything about you, or four generations, whatever it is. You might be into you know, Ancestry.com and you got that covered, but um, the likelihood of Ancestry.com being there, I don't know. But it, you know, it's like people, you know, people want to be remembered, and that, that's a noble thing, we want to be remembered. But do we really think that our legacy is going to go on for generations and generations and generations? I mean, if you look at how many generations just from Christ it's been, um, so many people. Um, but I love about, with, especially with the Jews, they know their tribes. Yeah, what, what tribe are you from? They'll tell you like that. It's been passed down from generation to generation. It's the only people group that has survived all this time of maintaining their language and maintaining our identity, even though they were scattered for you know, 2,000 years, basically. And they still have their identity. Why? Because it, they're part of God's plan. It, God hasn't given up on Israel. It, they're still in the end times. It's Jesus in Matthew 24, he mainly are talking to Jews in that chapter. We're kind of eavesdropping in. He's giving them instructions on what to do once they find themselves in the Great Tribulation. And all of a sudden, the Antichrist that fulfills Daniel starts claiming to be God and desecrating the temple and all this stuff. And they, you know, they're going to go back and Oh, he said to run to the hills. We need to go to, you know, the mountains or the mountain ranges or Petra or wherever it is. And so uh, it's all leading somewhere. But he says it's like the wind. It just takes us, gone. One, here day, one day, gone the next. So we are just a small thread of, in the tapestry of time. God knows that, and he has pity on us. We have just to have a flash. That's why it matters so much what we do for Christ. It matters so much what we do for Christ. Because that's what our rewards and our status, so to speak, with related to rewards and responsibility and all of that comes from, is our faithfulness now. Francis Chan, you can, if you haven't seen this, you can go on YouTube and, and just put in Francis Chan rope. And he has this long rope. And he has the very tip painted red. And he goes, this is, your, <laughs> this is our life right here. When we focus all our attention on this, when... All this huge long rope is eternity, where we're going to be for eternity. And our faithfulness now, what we do for him now, determines all of that. 
if you, especially if you believe in investing, like we were investing and we're sending our rewards forward, and, and, and we have to have the eternal perspective. That's why we need God's word, because God's word says your citizenship is in heaven. That's, that's who, that's, we're just passing through, we're pilgrims. We don't belong here. The closer you get to Christ, the real... The, and so the more you see that, and, and it shouldn't disturb you. It should confirm that you are a child of God and confirm uh, that you know, this is the time that we're in and all these things. So I just think that it's great to remind ourselves that. Um, now, David, he gets to you know, encouraging us in verse 17. And he said, But the mercy is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his... Righteousness to children's children. So yes, we're temporal. But the one that we love and the one that we follow, the one that we worship, the one that we serve, he is from everlasting to everlasting. And that mercy will be go on forever. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, we're told in the ages to come, we'll learn the richness of his grace. So we're never going to stop learning about his grace for all eternity, which means that I don't get all knowledge when in my new body like, just dropped into my noggin, and I know everything. It just I means when it talks about we will know as we are fully known, I believe that talks about with, among each other, that we're going to know each other, we're going to recognize. I told Judy before, we're going to be walking on the streets of gold together going, can you believe this? You know, and the more I hear about her mom, the more I want to be walking with her. I mean, talk about the matriarch, my goodness. So that's, I'm, we're going to be in the new Jerusalem together. We're going to experience all those things together. It's a beautiful thing. But he says, all who fear him. He says that three times. All those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. So there's the legacy, but God produces it. He produces righteousness and, and, and um, you know, blesses people and, and helps them understand their heritage and all of that. He does that so well. To such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. So, but that's different for us. We're not under the old covenant now. You have to realize that this is different. This isn't dependent upon us. It's dependent upon how God works it out between the Father and the Son and, and, and everything. And he's, they're going to be faithful to the new covenant uh, with us as we receive Christ and everything and as we grow. So, um, that's a little bit different. Verse 19, And the Lord established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. And so he, he says that in verse 19, but he starts to close here, in, in, and I love this because he's beginning to call out the angels to worship and his creation in a minute, but he says, verse 20, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who ex excel in strength. Do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. So now David's the worship leader for the angels. Just walks right into that. Says, hey, you need to, angels, you need to worship the Lord. In fact, he even goes further in that when in verse 22 when he says, Bless the Lord, all, um, all his works. That's all his creation. He's telling all creation to worship God, to praise the Lord, to, to bless his name, all these things. He's, he's now is expanding it. He's beyond his own soul and indirectly with us, sharing with us. And he, now he says, all, and that we're specifically in you know, verse 22, all his works. We are his works. I mean, specifically Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he's prepared in advance that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship, his poema, that's the word, his poem, his work of art. Uh, it's beautiful in that, in that uh, passage. So we'll stop there, but I just wanted to remind us that just how much he wants us to focus on what we, what we have to be thankful for. And we're, be thankful in all things. Not some all things, in all things. And, you know, as we do that, that works against ungratefulness. I kind of believe that in some ways, ungratefulness in a sense, in our hearts, in our fallen nature, kind of just automatically happens. But we have to focus on how good he is, how great he is, how wonderful he is, and, and, and think about um, how he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Peter said that. He's given us all things that pertain to life and God. He hasn't held anything back. He hasn't withheld one good thing from us. And so he wants us to be a thankful people and also to think about 
expecting in faith how he's going to work and how he's going to bless us in the future. Because he is. He's a good God. He can't help himself. My old worship leader, Dave Miller, used to say that. He can't help himself because he's, he's a great God. It's who he is. So knowing his ways is, is knowing his benefits, is knowing him, and it all works together. He, you can't know him without him revealing himself to you and, and pouring out benefits on your life and to, to show his acts to you. Just And David would say this today, that he's just like the children of Israel. God is showing you all these great wonders and manifesting himself to us. And I think it's good for us to be, to you know, to every once in a while to, to, to count our blessings, to think about those things and to be grateful because God is so faithful. Even when we're not faithful, he's faithful. He's that solid rock. And what can creep in, like I talked a little bit less last week, is that we can start getting into a, a legalistic or a law-based relationship with him because we feel like if I, I have to do these things and then he'll do these things, you know, that he'll love me, he'll accept me. But God's word is, reveals that we love him because he first loved us. So he, he loves us. He can't help himself, you know, and he wants to, just like your kids. I mean, you want to bless your kids if you have children or grandchildren, you want to bless them. There's no law that could make you do that. What if, what if there was a law? Do they even need a law saying that as parents, we need to give gifts to our children when it's appropriate? We don't need a law. Why? Because we have a love relationship with our kids. And God has a love relationship with us. So we don't have a relationship with a lawyer or a judge. or We have a relationship with a Savior who died for us. That's the starting place as we think about what he's done for us. So he wants us to, res- to live a life of worship, to live a life that is w- walking in obedience, walking in faith, walking like when things come into our lives and we're grappling with these things to honor him in that moment. It takes a habit of doing this consistently for it to become part of a regular thing that happens in our lives. And we stop and go, okay, what I'm feeling, is that biblical? Is that something that li- aligns with God's word? Now this presupposes you know God's word. So if you don't know God's word, then you're not going to be able to know as much these things. So does it align with God's word? Okay, so it aligns with God's word that I'm on safe ground. And there's a lot of craziness out there. People make stuff up. People, you know, and again, I go back to the classic test. Did Jesus teach on it or practice it? Was it practiced in the book of Acts? And was it taught on in the epistles? Safeguard. There's a lot of things that don't meet that test that people are trying to put on us. That we have to do, it's binding on us. And, and it's usually something related to the Old Testament or something else that there's all kinds of legalistic things that aren't even, they don't even have a scripture proof text in the Old Testament that they're trying to use. So you have to guard against that. You have to know that and you have to guard against your own heart um, going, you know, you can't, I've had talked to people where they feel guilty that, that they have the initial thoughts, the initial, you know, emotions, we can't, we can't respond to that. I mean, we can't adequate, like, that's, that's just, we are just humans and we're fallen. You know, that's not our identity, but it is a reality that we have our, a sinful nature. Things just, things pop in our heads. Now, once we determine that we're going to keep thinking about that, if it's not biblical, then now we're sinning. And we're talking, it doesn't have to be like this overtly sinless thing. It's just something that's contrary to God's word, you know, um, God loves those who love themselves or help themselves. Like God loves everybody. So there's all kinds of things. Um, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness, not in the scripture. We don't have to love ourselves first before we love anybody else. That's not in scripture. I could go my whole long list of things. I hear them all the time. But if, if we know what scripture says, then we can take these thoughts captive, and including the ones that, well... Maybe, you know, I feel like God hasn't forgiven me for that thing that I already confessed and I did what his word says to do. I repented, I confessed, I made amends, whatever, but I still feel like he hasn't, he hasn't forgiven me. That goes against everything in scripture. You have no right to elevate your own thoughts above his word in that way, and it's hurting you. You have to go by what scripture says. That's why it's so important to learn what it says, what his promises are, who he says we are in Christ, uh, it's so important to, to know that so that we can guard against that. I think I told this one time, but you know, when I was a new Christian, they told me that if you go to Costco um, you know, and 
you know, you, you, you're with your child and your child just starts putting things in, you know, you don't notice it, it's fine. I mean, it's like, it's, you don't, it's no harm done, right? You have to go back and all that stuff, like, okay, Costco's a big place, uh, where am I going to, you know, why'd you grab, gra- I mean, how a kid could grab, like, you know, a giant thing of peanut butter or whatever they have, you know, there. So, but you're accountable once you paid for it. And paid for it is, is the equivalent in that scenario is, when I actually allow it to stay in my mind and I don't reject it and then replace it with something because, you know, minds can't just be a vacuum. When we replace it with something that is like Philippians 4 talks about, you know, praiseworthy, a good report, kind and gracious and all these great themes of scripture. And it's great to memorize scripture and then in those times just recite or practice memorizing scripture, related, especially related to whatever you're battling with. But... That's such a protection uh, that God has given us. So let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We are thankful. We are so grateful for what you've done for us. We, we don't ever feel like we can adequately respond to how you've blessed us. We are just thankful, and you are a good God, and we're just so blessed to know you, those of us that do. And we just thank you that you you thought of everything. You, you, you do all things well still today. And we just so so grateful. We're the recipients. You've lavished upon us this amazing uh, new covenant that we get to be a part of by your grace. And we just thank you so much for it. We honestly, truly, from our hearts, thank you now for how great you've been. We pray that you would help us to cultivate a habit of walking in thankfulness. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.